Is Tovia Singer right about the empty tomb? This is Impact Evangelism. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the King. Jesus is the Messiah that died for the sins of mankind and rose from the dead. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, shall be saved. This is the Disciples' Trilemma, Part 32. And in this video series, we look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we look at the disciples' testimony that's found within the New Testament. And when you look at the disciples' testimony about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there are only three conclusions you can come to. Either they were mistaken, they were deceivers, or they were telling the truth. And this video series takes the position that yes, they were telling the truth. Jesus did rise from the dead. This is the third video where we look at Tovia Singer and what he has to say about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now in the first video that I looked at, he says that Mary Magdalene invented the resurrection story. He says that she was crazy and that she hallucinated Jesus risen from the dead and uh, because she hysterically saw Jesus risen from the dead that that resurrection story grew into a big myth and that's how we get our New Testament. It's all a, a hallucination from a crazy lady named Mary Magdalene. And our second video that we looked at, he says that there is a contradiction in the Gospels about when Mary Magdalene saw Jesus risen from the dead. Now what he does to get to this supposed contradiction is he uses two books of the go two gospel books, Matthew and John. And that's it. And all he has to do is take a look at Mark and Luke, and then the tension disappears concerning when Mary Magdalene saw Jesus risen from the dead. And you can go back and look at that video. But what he does is he does the buffet criticism, I call it. He has buffet arguments, meaning this. He picks and chooses a gospel to try to disprove the resurrection. He tries to find internal contradictions within the resurrection uh, accounts in the gospels. And he'll pick and choose. They'll say, I'll take Matthew and I'll take John, but I'll discount Mark and Luke. And in the video I'm going to look at today, he does the same thing. He does the buffet criticism. He has the buffet argument. He leaves out the Gospel of John and picks and chooses other Gospels to try to come to a conclusion that's not really there. And all he has to do is harmonize all four Gospels and not pick and choose because the contradictions are not there. They're invented. They are invented when you don't look at all the resurrection accounts. When you don't look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as a whole, uh, they harmonize with each other. There is no contradiction. So, what he tries to do is to the buffet criticism, right? He picks and chooses which ones he wants to talk about and which ones he'll dis discount out of hand. But then he'll also go back and take those same accounts that he discounted and use them again. In other words, he's not being consistent. If he would just take the Gospels as a whole, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, concerning the resurrection accounts, no contradictions, and they harmonize perfectly. Let's take a look at a clip that he uses to show that Mary Magdalene was crazy and that she was the one that invented the Gospel narrative about the resurrection, that she imagined the whole thing. Now let's take a look at this clip and then we'll match it to another clip and you'll see what I mean about his buffet arguments. To them, the mental illness that unfortunately so many people suffer from was considered a, a devil, a demon that had to be cast out using incantations. You're right, you see it all over the Christian Bible because they didn't understand this. So you, hear, you have in Luke, we're told that Mary Magdala, 
she had demons, not one but many demons, cast out of her by Jesus in Luke chapter 8. It's the only mention of this Mary outside of the Passion narratives. She's only mentioned 12 times, but only once she's mentioned uh, outside of the Passion narratives. This actually looms huge for Christianity because I'm fairly certain, I can't, be, I can't prove it, but it, in fact this person, this Mary, is probably the one who imagines seeing a resurrected Jesus. And that's why she's so prominent in the resurrection accounts. She's actually front and center in the resurrection accounts. I mean, she is the person. We have all sorts of Marys in the Christian Bible. But Mary Magdalene, she is the only one that is at front and center in every Passion narrative because the Passion narratives are very famous, particularly the resurrection accounts, are very famous for having different women come to the tomb early Sunday morning. So Rabbi Singer in this argument uses the passages of Scripture that talk about Mary Magdalene visiting the empty tomb. He says Mary is front and center. I mean, he makes this perfectly clear. He's using these passages of Scripture where Mary visits the tomb as the middle, the very heart of the resurrection narratives. Now, I won't argue with that. That's true. But he uses those verses to prove that Mary Magdala was crazy and that she was the one that uh, hallucinated the resurrection story and that got changed around and then it got turned into what's in our Bibles today. So that's what he says in that video. And here today we're going to look at what he says about the same passages of Scripture. Yes, the very same passages of Scripture that he uses to try to prove that Mary Magdalene was crazy, he uses to try to prove another point. Now keep in mind this is what I call the buffet criticism. He just kind of picks and chooses Gospels when he wants to to create contradictions that are not there and they fall away. His arguments melt away when you look at all four Gospels. Let's take a look at this clip. Therefore, the story that we find in the very first verse of Mark chapter 16, in Luke, in chapter 24, verse 1, that never happened. That's all nonsense. So in this clip, we see that the very passages of Scripture that he used to try to show that Mary Magdalene was the one who invented the resurrection story, he says never happened. And he discounts these out of hand as never happening. So the very same passages of Scripture that he uses to prove that Mary Magdalene was crazy and invented the resurrection story, he says that these same exact passages of Scripture are total fiction and were never, and never happened. They were totally made up. He picks and chooses, like, like I said, the buffet arguments to try to draw tension that's not in the Gospels, to try to, try to draw up his own imagined contradiction, his own uh, contradiction of his own making that's not there. When all he has to do is look at all four Gospel narratives and see if they harmonize, and they do. And so what he does in the video we're going to look at today, he totally dismisses the Gospel of John, which will totally annihilate his argument. So the question comes up, why should we take all four Gospels uh, as a whole? Uh, well, it's pretty simple. Let me explain it. The, at the earliest points of the church, uh, these Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and they were distributed in the first century. They were written at different times uh, for different groups of people. But by the end of the first century, the church recognized the fourfold gospel. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, considering as one unit to be read and one unit to be studied to get the complementary uh, scenarios concerning not just the resurrection, 
but Jesus' life. And so we can look, to, look at history at this. We look at uh, the Moratorian Fragment, which says that all of these uh, Gospels go together. We can look at Irenaeus of Lyon, who was a bishop. We can look at, uh, let's see, we can look at Alexandria and find a guy named Clement who says the same thing. So we see that through these testimonies, and Tertullian of Carthage also, I forgot about him, you can look at these different data points in history, these early church fathers that demonstrate that at least by the turn of the second, about the end of the second century, that all of the Gospels were counted as one. They were in codices by then. And so if it's that at least by the second century, which means it happened earlier, probably the mid middle of the second century, the early church in four corners of the Roman Empire, by the way, from Carthage to Italy to France or Gaul, and all the way over to uh, Turkey, what we call modern-day Turkey, all of these areas had the four Gospels. So what you need to do is you need to look at all four Gospels to get your arguments, to get your contradictions. And in today's video, we're going to look at a contradiction that he tries to come up with. Maybe not a contradiction, but let's call it an argument that says that the women visiting the empty tomb never happened. In other words, the empty tomb was never an empty tomb. Let's take a look at his arguments and we'll go from there. And that's the reason why John, as he does often, is he corrects errors in the Synoptic Gospels. And John introduces us to a character that was unknown in all the Synoptic Gospels, unknown in the letters of Paul, and that's Nicodemus. Nicodemus is important for Jesus' conversation, chapter 3, not going there now. He changes it to have Nicodemus take care of everything, the spices and so on, before the burial. Now, I don't want to waste time talking about there's a contradiction. So, he says right off the bat, he doesn't want to even waste time with the Gospel of John, and he gives a reason that Nicodemus isn't named in the Pauline epistles. That's pretty weak. Or, oh, uh, he wasn't mentioned in the Synoptic Gospels. That's very weak as well. So he cr creates a contradiction, a tension that's not there by just dismissing a whole Gospel account about the resurrection. Uh, he, he tries to come up with the story that the women never visited the empty tomb, where John, we'll, sh we'll look at that where John compliments the other three Gospels and gives a very good basic logical story of what happened there at the tomb. It's the buffet argument in full effect. So let's just take Mark as an example. The last verse of Mark 15, the first verse of Mark 16, that after the Sabbath, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, Salome, they brought spices to anoint Jesus' body. That was the reason why they went to the tomb Sunday morning. In Luke, we find a very similar story at the end of Luke chapter 23, verse 56. They went home to prepare the spices and perfumes, and then the women rested on the Sabbath in obedience because they kept the law of the Sabbath. You don't prepare spices during Shabbos. And very importantly, on the first day of the week, that means now we're going to Luke 24, verse 1, what do they do? The women took the spices, they prepared, and they went to the tomb. So we have these stories where the body of the crucified Jesus is buried before the Shabbos, and women come to the tomb Sunday morning because pff, we forgot to anoint with the spices. So we have to put the spices on the dead corpse. Notice he doesn't use the Gospel of John in his argument. Like I said at the top, he dismisses it, throws it out because it makes his argument go away. So he just uses two Gospels here to try to set up his false narrative. Uh, so he sets it up pretty well. Let's uh, continue and see what he says now. This story never happened. It's complete nonsense. And ask yourself this question. Did anyone that you know of in your life, in history, ever go to a tomb three days later because some anointment had to be placed on a now rotting corpse? It never happens. Let me provide the background because the idea of having spices with the person who passed away is all over Jewish tradition. 
and it's important to explain. The moment the person dies, the body immediately is decomposing, immediately. And as you can figure out, the body that is decomposing, it won't take very long for the body to give off an unpleasant odor, which is considered a bizarre hames. It's considered a disgrace to the dead person. Do you understand this? So the reason he's inferring that the ladies go back to the empty tomb on, on a Sunday morning is to perform the burial rites on a dead corpse, which is not true. <laughs> because we look in the Gospel of John and we see that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were the ones who took Jesus' body off of the cross and they were the ones that performed the burial rites with uh, the, the spices and the wrappings. He'll get into that a little bit later. But it was these two men that took care of that. And the women knew that they took care of that. Let's take a look at what the Gospel of John has to say. This is John chapter 19, verses 38 through 40. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. So we see in the Gospel of John that Joseph and Nicodemus were the ones who performed the burial rites on the corpse of Jesus Christ. Now it's also interesting to note that when John and the other writers of the Gospels as well, when they mention someone by name, uh, this was a real person. Now, you know, John could have just not even named Nicodemus. And that would, you know, that would take some objections away. Who's this Nicodemus guy? Well, he's not in Paul's letters. We, we can discount the Gospel of John, which is what Rabbi Singer does. But the reason why he's named is because he was there. He was the one that did it, right? But when John names a person, it usually means this person is well known and this person became part of the Christian community after the resurrection of Christ and after the church started. So when these Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they could have been verified by eyewitnesses. You could have gone back and talked to Nicodemus. You could have gone back and talked to at least someone who knew Nicodemus, who was still around in the first century, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke both could have had all of their information corroborated because they were written within the first century when people were still alive that knew what had happened. And when John named somebody by name like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, he's showing that these are real people that you can go and check out. Another point I want to make is maybe not obvious uh, right off the top, but when you look at it, it makes common sense. Why would Mark, which he go, went over Mark's account, why would Mark put in an account that if he says it's so ludicrous that no one would believe that it's just, you know, crazy, it's just obviously never happened, uh, why would Mark even put that in his gospel? Uh, we know that Mark pretty much got his gospel message from Peter when Peter was preaching in Rome. This is the book of Mark. And so why would Mark leave in something that would discredit the resurrection story itself, which is why they wrote the Gospels. They were trying to spread the message of Christ. And why would Mark, in the first century, write a Gospel about Jesus Christ that made no sense to anyone that read it? Well, he left it in there because it does make sense, unlike uh, what Tovia Singer says about it. It makes perfect sense, and we're going to show why. But he makes some further points, so let's look at what he has to say. It means imagine you're in Yushalayim. It could be a hot day. It could be 90 degrees, and the body is 
now giving off a an odor that is unpleasant. The point is the body is decomposing. So they had techniques, and this is described in our literature, that when washing the body, they would sometimes add spices to that washing process. It's called a tahira. They would have spices in the shroud or around the shroud. There was a specific combination of spices that were so strong that would completely mask the smell of the decaying body. The point is that until you get inside the tomb, it could be hours and hours. So therefore, in short, the spices are added so that during the funeral procession, so that during the burial procession, no one smells the odor of the decaying body. So Rabbi Singer does a great job of describing to us what a first century burial would have looked like before 70 AD in Jerusalem. And you know what? What he just described describes exactly what Nicodemus <laughs> and Joseph of Arimathea did. Now you notice something he said washing. Now that's going to come up a little bit later. He says that they came to wash the body. And that's exactly right. That's what these burial rites were on a corpse. It had to be washed. And then uh, the spices and things like that. And then wrapped in linen. And this is exactly what the Gospel of John describes already happening. Not the women, but Joseph and Nicodemus already performing before Sunday morning. Now it's interesting to note that these women were aware of what Joseph and Nicodemus did. You see, the Gospels, uh, they harmonize with each other very well if you read them carefully. You see, the women were there when Jesus was crucified. The same women that went to visit the tomb on Sunday morning were the same women that were with Jesus when he was crucified. And you look at all four Gospels to get who the women were. You can't pick and choose. You can't do the buffet, right? The buffet argument, well, I'll take Mark, and I'll take... I'll take Matthew, I'll take John, but I'll leave out Mark and Luke to get that Mary Magdalene was by herself. Uh, and some other, there's only two Marys that saw Jesus first, then Mary sees her again. No, see, that's what he did on one video. Go check it out. Now, you know, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but my point being, the buffet arguments don't work. Well, they do work if you are not interested in what really happened <laughs> and you're not interested in the truth. Yeah, you can do that. But the contradictions are not there. They're, the tension is not there. They perfectly harmonize. You see, these women were there at the crucifixion. They were there at the burial. They saw Jesus being buried, the burial rites being performed. And how do I know that? It's in the Bible. Luke chapter 23, verse 55. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. You see, they saw Jesus being buried. So why would they go back on a Sunday morning to perform burial rites that they knew had already been done? The answer, they wouldn't. They were not going back on Sunday to perform the burial rites with the wrapping of the linens and the spices and the this and the that. No, they were there for a reason. And we'll get into that reason, uh, but let's hear some more of his points. Once the body is buried, and I think you know where this is all going, nobody digs up a dead body, or in this case, if it's buried in a mausoleum or buried in a cave, no one uncovers the cave three days later to put spices inside. This is all complete nonsense. No one ever does because there's no reasons to do it. The whole point of adding spices, it's not like you have to have spices. If there's no spices with the body, then the body doesn't go to heaven. It has nothing to do with this. No, no mystery to all this. Therefore, the story that we find in the very first verse of Mark chapter 16, in Luke, in chapter 24, verse 1, that never happened. That's all nonsense. of Lainivra, there was no reason to go to a tomb after someone's been in it for three days. What are you trying to do? You're trying to make sure who can smell the body. 
So how the heck did this ever wind up in, in a couple of books of the Gospels? Ah, the old buffet argument strikes again. He leaves out the Gospel of John totally, where it says that Nicodemus and Joseph were the ones who performed the burial rites. And he also, he doesn't look at the verse where in Luke, where it says that the ladies observed Jesus being laid in the tomb, which means they were there when Joseph and Nicodemus performed the burial rites. So his whole argument, first he has to do the buffet thing to throw John out the window that, uh, that harmonizes it all perfectly. To make a story that the women came back on a Sunday morning to perform the burial rites, which he, uh, again, lays out perfectly what it's like. Now notice, when he talks about uh, Mark, in Mark chap uh, chapter 16, verse 1, he says, The women came back to anoint, to anoint the body, not to wash the body. That should give you a clue as to why the women came back. Let's remember what Tovia Singer says about burial rites. So they had techniques, and this is described in our literature, that when washing the body, they would sometimes add spices to that washing process. It's called a tahira. Ah, washing process. And Mark says they went to anoint. Anoint is not the same thing as wash. Why would they wash the body again when they saw with their own eyes, according to Luke and the other Gospels, that they, Nicodemus and Joseph, according to the Gospel of John, that he leaves out. They were the ones that buried Jesus. They were the ones that washed his body, performed the burial rites, laid him in the tomb, and the women saw this. So when they went back Sunday morning, they were not going back to perform burial rites. He just said that a burial rite involved washing and the linen and things like that. They did not go back to do all that. They went back simply to anoint. Now the women didn't anoint the body of Jesus when Nicodemus and Joseph were taking care of the burial rites. It wouldn't serve a purpose there. And they didn't do it uh, the next day because the next day was the Sabbath. So the earliest date that they could come and to anoint Jesus would have been on a Sunday morning. And that's when they came. Now he does point out that the body would, be, would have been smelly, but that's true. But <laughs> the body would not have been as smelly because the burial rites had already taken place when the Mary and the other women got there to anoint his body. And they knew that the burial rites had already been performed, and they knew that the smell would have been at a minimum. Uh, he was not laying in a tomb for three days with no burial rites done on him. He had already had those uh, completed. And also in Jewish law, when someone died right before the Sabbath day, you had to wait 24 hours to bury them. Okay, so let's take a look at this. When the women came back to anoint the body of Jesus on a Sunday morning, Jesus' body had already gone under the burial practices with the wrapping of the linen and the spices and the washing of the body by Joseph and Nicodemus. That had already happened. And so it would have been only about 12 more hours than uh, someone waiting for a Sabbath to get over with. So that's 24 hours plus 12. So that's just 12 more hours that the women waited to anoint the body of Jesus who had already gone under the burial practice as opposed to a total 24-hour period with a body not receiving any treatment whatsoever. I would surmise that the first uh, scenario, the body probably would have been decomposing quick, more quickly and probably smelled a little bit worse as well. So his uh, big deal about the smelling part uh, doesn't hold water. The women were not there to perform burial rites. They were there simply to anoint Jesus. Now, Tovia Singer makes the statement that who has ever heard of a person going back 
within three days to visit a body. And Craig Keener disagrees with Tovia Singer. Craig Keener is a uh, New Testament scholar, and he says this, that Jewish mourners were known to have visited tombs within three days of a burial. Jewish mourners, let me underline that word, mourners, were known to visit a body within three days of burial. That's why the women came on a Sunday morning, not to perform the burial rites that they witnessed and knew had already taken place. They were there to perform a mourning uh, exercise on Jesus. It was simply an act of devotion, an act of mourning, like a person would do today when they put flowers on a grave. Or if you've ever been to a funeral and you see someone maybe put place a personal item within a casket before someone is buried. Or you might see someone, you know, straighten someone's tie or do some act of devotion or honoring this person. Uh, that's all they were doing. It was an act of mourning, an act of honor, an act of worshiping their Lord who had died. So they were going back Sunday morning to do this, to mourn, to anoint the body as a mourning practice, not as a burial rite. Uh, all you have to do is read the Gospel of John and they harmonize perfectly. Leave John out and you can make it, you know, the Gospels say a whole bunch of stuff if you don't include all the Gospels. But the buffet tactic, picking and choosing which Gospels to use to try to come up with a contradiction that doesn't exist is just sloppy and shouldn't be done. So the women came on Sunday morning to perform this, this act of mourning on their Lord and they did not get to do it. Do you know why they didn't get to do it? Because Jesus had risen from the dead. <laughs> Jesus was alive and he's still alive. Jesus conquered the grave. He conquered death. He conquered sin. He conquered Satan by his resurrection and his death, vicarious death on the cross for you. And these women were not able to do this act of mourning on the body of Jesus because the body of Jesus had walked out of the tomb. Jesus is alive. And you who are watching this video can receive this same Lord who walked up out of the tomb on that Sunday morning that these women came there to worship and to honor. And now he's alive. And they worship him as well. They're in heaven today worshiping the Lord. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father and he's sending out his spirit to convict people like you who are watching this video to bow the knee to King Jesus, receive Jesus as your Messiah, and to give Him your life, trust Him as your Lord. And you will have your sins forgiven, and you can become a member of the kingdom of God simply by repenting of your sins and trusting in Jesus. Will you do that today? And you Christian who's watching this video now, do you want to make an impact on this world? If you do, go out today and share the gospel.